Church, can we give Jesus a shout in this place? There's nothing, nothing that will keep him from coming after us. And what confidence does that give us that the Lord is chasing, that he's pursuing us? Man, what a way to, to well, I mean, to close out the, the singing part of worship. But we're going to continue. Uh, what I want you to do is... You know, we need to high five. There needs to be more high fives in church. Y'all agree? Can I get an amen? No, just... Hey, this is what I want you to do. Is I want you to high five three people and say, I hoped you'd be here today. Y'all can get up out your seats. It's okay. All right, that's enough fellowshipping, guys. We don't do that in church. Come on now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, I'm excited you guys are here. I'm glad we got to interact. If you didn't meet your quota, you owe me 10 burpees. We'll talk about that later. Um, but <laughs> I'm excited to be up here. You know, last week, Pastor Mark delivered this huge message called What's Your Motivation? If you didn't listen to it, you need to go check it out. Like, it was amazing. It was super convicting. And he, he asked this question. He says, when you remove the things that motivate us, and he used the examples of trophies, when you rem uh, re use the example of spankings, <laughs> I remember those. <laughs> and when he used the example of grinding, he said, what, when you remove those things from a generation, you get an unmotivated generation. And honestly, I think that leads to entitlement. So you have a generation that feels like they're owed things instead of learning what it means to earn it. But he, he, he brought up trophies and medals and he said, you know, we, we drive and we push so hard to win these things, then eventually the things that we're chasing after end up in a closet. You know, are the things that you're going after, are they kingdom-minded? Are they eternal? Are they long-lasting? And then he read one of my favorite scriptures. How many of you know the Bible defines greatness? Jesus says, it says, if you want to be great, oh, echo, come on, holler at your boy. Uh, he says, if you want to be great, you'll take the place of a servant. And he says, if you want to be first, you'll take the place of a slave. So he asked the question, what's your motivation? What's your motivation? Is it you or is it the kingdom? So I want to continue from that place. I want to talk to you from the idea of the moment that changed everything. The moment that changed everything. So if you've got a Bible, open it to Isaiah chapter 6. 
This is usually where I would insert an Android joke, but I'm out of them. So you Android users are okay for today. Um, but while you're opening your Bible though, to Isaiah chapter 6, let me give you some information. Isaiah is uh, the first book of the major prophets. Isaiah is he's a prophet for the Lord. He'll hear from the Lord. He'll prophesy the uh, Assyrian exile, but he'll also prophesy the new covenant. Uh, if you're still looking for it, the book of Isaiah is a couple books after the book of Psalms which is the biggest book in the Bible, and it's directly after the book, The Song of Solomon, which, if you're married, is a great read. If you're not, just stick to Judges, okay? <laughs> True story, I can't make this up. After I got saved, I used to carry this pocket Bible, and I like to make situations awkward. So uh, I was in, I remember being in high school, and I would raise my hand and ask the teacher, I was like, Miss, what does it mean that her neck is like an ivory tower? And she's like, Matt. Shut up. Like, I think she knew the context of where that was going. Because if you read Song of Solomon, it gets real descriptive. I'm just saying. Right? So what I want to do is we're going to read Isaiah 6, verse 8. And it says this. It says, And I heard the, Lord, the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. So before we dive in, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. God, man, we thank you that we know your presence is here. God, and that you are chasing after us, and there's, there's no shadow you won't light up and mountain you won't climb up to come after us. So, dear Heavenly Father, God, we pray that your spirit would invade our hearts, that it would come and move in this place. And, Lord, if it is your will, we pray that Bradley's teeth would all come in tonight. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Listen, the Bible says you have not because you ask not. I'm asking, okay? <laughs> I ain't going to hold back. So, have you ever had a moment that, like, changed your life? And if you're like me, I'm like, oh, my gosh, you got to eat this. It'll change your life, right? Uh, a couple of examples is, and y'all can judge me later, but stretchy jeans. <laughs> Holler at your boy. Some of y'all, like, stretchy. I, I know you guys, you're like, I'm country, man. I wear Wranglers. I'm like, okay, get over yourself. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But stretchy jeans, like, really changed my life. When you're as tall as I am, it... yeah, I saw that coming. Listen, some of y'all don't know. Let me give you, let me teach you something. Short is a made up word. I'm going to prove it to you. How many of you know the word cold was made up to define the lack of heat? So cold really doesn't exist. There's just a lower gauge of heat present. So I believe that short is a made up word to describe the lack of tall. So I'm actually tall. You guys are just taller. <laughs> That's just true. That's it. Yeah, huh? And everybody said amen. No, <laughs> just so when you're as tall as I am, and I played catcher my whole life, and so I've always kind of had big legs. Anytime you stepped up into a truck, it was risky. You're like, all right, these jeans are six months old. Am I going to take this risk or am I going to ride in a car? So I chose the car most of the time. Um, another time, another moment that changed my life was when my wife turned 18. Uh, if you know us, you know our story. I'm six years older than my wife. We got married when I was 24 and she was 18. And I remember the first time I met her, we like, I was at this thing and I see her, I was like, oh my gosh, she's fine. And, and I was like, how old is she? And when I found out, I was like, nope. Just kind of turned <laughs> and went the opposite direction. But the Lord does what the Lord does, right? So uh, my wife's awesome. We ended up becoming best friends. And then in the words of the great theologian Beyonce, when she turned 18, I liked it. So I put a ring on it. You know what I'm saying? You know, so that was a moment that changed my life. But on a more serious note, um, have you ever had a moment in your life that completely changed the direction of your life? Like, had that moment not happened, you would not be where you are today. Mine was the first time I came to, to, to the river. Um, I got saved as a sophomore in high school, so I'm only 12 years old, and Lord, I'm still a baby, still growing. And I knew when I was in high school I was called to ministry. So I went to Lubbock Christian, went to Lubbock uh, LCU, played ball all four years, and got a degree in youth and family studies. But during that time there, I served three years at my home church as an intern, and it was horrible. Uh, just to be honest with you, I ended up resigning my last year, and I convinced myself, if this is what church is, I want nothing to do with it. Like, I don't even sign me up. So my senior year of college, I quit going to church. Uh, part of it was because I felt like I was going to church every day and getting graded for it. I'm going to tell you that's a horrible perspective. You need the body of Christ. But I also started sacking groceries, and after I graduated college, within a year, I was already an assistant manager. Corporate knew my name. They knew who I was, so I was like, dude, I'm just going to live it up in the grocery industry. Uh, yeah. So I'm kind of going through life, and I 
get this conviction, I need to go back to church. So I go to this church called Experience Life and love it. It's an amazing church. They're doing great things for the kingdom. And um, I remember being in worship, and they do environmental lighting. A lot of their worship service looks a lot like ours. And I remember being in worship and people being sold out, going after the Lord and going after his presence. And I remember it sounding completely silent to me until I heard the Lord say, this isn't what I created you to do. How many of you know when you hear that, things change, right? That service, it's kind of ironic. They were talking about expanding into Amarillo, launching a campus. So Super Bowl Sunday, seven years ago, I'll never forget it. Uh, me and my mom go to Experience Life. We go and we sit through their service. I meet their campus pastor. I already sent them an email, so they were expecting me. And on my way back into Lubbock, I get a phone call from Pastor Mark six years ago. I hadn't talked to him in like six, or it was seven years ago, but I hadn't talked to him in like six years. He's like, hey, Matt, I don't know where you are in life. We're looking for a youth pastor, and Cindy had a dream, and it was you. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> you don't know what I was just doing today. He's like, I was just talking with a church today about joining, going into ministry. And that's how I got here. And that was a moment that changed everything. Because from saying yes, from hearing from the Lord and responding to the Lord, it led me to where I am now, surrounded by the people that God has surrounded me with, with the people that speak life, that even bring correction, because we how many of you know we need those people in our life, right? And, and that have, have helped guide me and in, in speak into this path that God's called me to. For me, this is the moment that changed everything. Isaiah is about to have a similar moment. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to break this down very in a very expository kind of way, which means we're going to go verse by verse, maybe a little bit different, but it's going to be fun. I hope you're ready for the ride. Let's take a drink first. Ah, all right, here we go. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. It says, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. High and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, I want to stop right here. Like I said, verse by verse, this is kind of a, a real meaty text. Like, how many of you know we serve the God of victory? Okay, but, you know, that was all right, amen. Like, I'm not really, like, convinced that you really believe that. Because let me explain something. The Bible says that when you say yes to Jesus, you've been given a spirit, you've been given his spirit, and it doesn't make you slaves, it makes you sons and daughters. So when you put it in that perspective, how many of you know the God of victory is your daddy? That's your father, the one who never loses, right? See, Jesus comes on the scene and he changes things. I love it. In the Old Testament, God's referred to as Yahweh. He's referred to as Adonai. You'll see it as Lord God, which means the sovereign, the one true Lord. And he is those things. But there's this conversation with Jesus and his disciples. And the disciples say, teacher, teach us how to pray. This is how Jesus starts it off. Our Father. Hold on a second. But he's Lord God. Yeah, but he's our Father. Not just my Father, but he's your Father. In Jeremiah chapter 3, God says this. He's speaking through Jeremiah to this nation. And he says, I've longed for the day that I could treat you as children. And I've longed for the day that you would call me father. That's the father's heart. That's God's heart. The God of victory longs for the day or longed for the day because we're now in that day that you would call him father. How many of you know fathers pass down an inheritance? So if the God of victory is your daddy, guess what your inheritance is? It's victory. Your inheritance is victory. So then he says, I saw him high and lifted up. And this is huge because what, how many of you know that there is nobody that will ever be greater than God? There is no throne that will ever be established higher. There is no king higher, no president greater, no church leader more influential, and no world leader that will ever do more than our king. His name is Jesus. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That's our God. It's our daddy. And I just want to remind you, the last person that tried to establish a throne higher than his got cast out of heaven. Man, it's such a powerful thing to know that the one that we serve, nobody can overcome. The one that we serve, nobody can overcome. Then he goes, all right, so I see his throne high and lifted up. And then it says the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, this is huge because we, this is one of those things that if you just read by it, you'll miss it. In that time and in that culture, when kings would go to battle, Right? If they won, they would cut off part of the train of the, the, the defeated king and attach it to theirs. The train of the robe is the part that drags the ground. So how many of you know the longer the train, the more the victory? Right? The more victorious a person was, the longer the train of their robe. It says the train of his robe, it filled the whole temple. How many of you know we serve the God that's never lost? 
In fact, the Bible says Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the earth. Our job as the body of Christ is to usher that victory into this place. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. Right? To usher that victory in. See, the Bible says that you are more than a conqueror. You know why you're more than a conqueror? Because you serve the God that conquered. The Bible says you'll overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of his testimony. Or the word of the, yeah. The, the, you know what I'm saying. It's in there. It's just flowing. It's just, Spirit's doing what he does in caffeine. You know how that works. But it says you, you'll overcome. You know why you get to overcome? Because you serve the God that overcame. Right? The Bible says greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Why? Because like David versus Goliath, the God who never loses is on our side. See, what happens is when storms and trials come, you need to remind yourself, instead of who's against you, who is for you. You need to look at it that way. This is a, can, you, can somebody show me where David in the Bible tweeted? And he said, hey, guys, I need you to pray for me. I don't know if I'm going to win this battle. Didn't happen. I'm not saying it's wrong to ask for prayer. What I am saying is it's wrong to focus on the wrong thing. How many of you know when, when Goliath came out and he challenged the Israelite army, the one who was supposed to face him was the king. It was Saul. So what was the difference between Saul and David? Saul was too busy looking at Goliath while David was focusing on God. How do we know that? God, David shows up to Goliath. He says, the Lord whom you've defiled will deliver you into my hand. The Lord who you defiled. I've already got the victory because the Lord's handed it to me. And Saul's sitting on his sword. He's like, I can't fight this guy. He's like 10 foot tall. Have you seen his spirit? Weighs more than I do. I ain't doing it. Right? Quit focusing on who's going against you and start focusing on who's on your side because he's the God of victory and he's never lost. See, I have a problem when Christians live defeated. And there's two reasons why. Is one, it doesn't accurately portray our gospel. It doesn't. Where do we lose? Show me in the Bible where we lose. It doesn't happen. And, and Jesus, so we know this, John 10, 10, the, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, I came to give life and life abundantly. How can we show people life and life abundantly if we live defeated? Who would buy into that gospel? Who would buy into that good news? Nobody. The greatest representation of God in the world is supposed to be the body. Which means that if we're not living life, if we're not living life and life to the abundant, nobody's going to buy into that anyways. The second reason is it doesn't accurately portray your dad. It doesn't. Ephesians 5.1 says, imitate God as dear children. How many of you know the greatest form of worship is imitation? God's not threatened by your imitation. He's threatened when you try to replace him. But when you imitate him, it's like a son. You know, I used to, I'm sure I said this last time because it happens. Um, when, when I was growing up, my dad would mow the yard and I would grab the crossbar, the one in the middle. In my mind, I thought I was mowing the grass. But I wasn't. But I eventually grew to the place that I did. It's in your imitation that you grow into the things that God called you to be. But you, God wants us to imitate what he's doing. He wants us to focus on him. Listen to what he's saying. Say what he's saying. And act on what he's acting on. This is what you have to understand. If, if you're a son and the daughter of the God of victory, then you can't live life defeated. You can't. Because what it is, is it, it, it declares that you've bought more into your defeat than his victory. That's huge. All right, let's go. All right, this is huge. Sometimes, church, you need to, I'm going to say this from the pulpit. Don't judge me. Sometimes you need to remind yourself, who's your daddy? <laughs> yeah, I use that in a message. <laughs> I've always wanted to say, who's your daddy from the platform. <laughs> but it's so true. You need to remember, who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Listen, church, if you lean on your own strength, you're going to lose. That's it. As long as you try to fight the battle, you're going to lose. Why? Why would we try? Paul said it this way. He says, I delight in weakness. Why? Because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. When I don't try to do it on me, when I don't try to put it on my shoulders, I have great strength because the Lord, who is my refuge, will handle the business. Well, he'll take care of it. So why not lean on him? Why not run to him? Why not let him be the first place we go to? Right? So let's go to verse 2. It says, above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And the whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. So there's two things I want you to see here. And the first one, the first thing is this. is Did you see who they were calling out to? 
Okay, so if you don't know, the seraphim, these are these angels that are surrounding the throne. For all their existence, their, their job is to worship the king of kings. They're known as the, the, the burning ones, right? It, and it doesn't say that they shouted to God. Listen, I'm going to read it again. It says this. It says, one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The message reads it this way. It says they called back and forth to each other. So this is what you need to know is in this moment, in these times of worship, sometimes worship isn't us just declaring to God how good he is. Sometimes it's us reminding the people in front of us, to the left of us, to the right of us and behind us that God is still good. He's still faithful. That's where it comes back to this thing where I need you. I need you in my life because my, my week may have been tough. My week may have been hard, and your week may have been great, and you may have seen God's goodness, and it's you declaring God's goodness over me that gets me into this place that gets my mind back in the spot where it says, yeah, he is good. He's never left me. But Matt, that's in the Old Testament. Awesome. I'm going to show you a New Testament scripture. <laughs> Don't get drunk on wine. Oh, Ephesians 4. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Listen, speaking to one another with Psalms hymns and songs from the spirit paul is right he's like don't get drunk with wine don't get full with alcohol which is an interesting contrast because there's either don't get drunk on wine or be filled with the spirit uh, I, I, that's really interesting to me but he says speak to one another in psalms hymns, and songs like we're supposed to sing over one another how good god is it says they're yelling to each other holy 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 that's what they're, they're yelling back and forth, back and forth, because the presence of God is amongst them. Listen, if the presence of God is in here, then we need to be shouting over each other. That's how it works. And I love live stream, and if you're watching live stream, I, I mean, I, I wish you were here in person. I'm just going to tell you right now. If you're watching it because you're sick or you're, because you're traveling, awesome, that's what it's for. But if you're watching it because you didn't want to get out among people or you didn't want to get out of bed this morning, you're missing the point. You're missing the point. Live stream is not a supplement for corporate worship. We need each other. How else can we lock shields if you're not right next to me? The second thing is have they lost their passion? Have they lost their passion? The scripture said this. It says that the, the foundation shook at the voice of him. That's one angel. They're so passionate, and they're declaring to each other, holy, 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 so passionately that one angel is shaking the most sturdy part of the temple. The foundation is supposed to be the most sure part of the temple. If the foundation cracks, everything else falls, right? So they're yelling so loud, holy, holy, holy. They're so passionate. And listen, they've done this for all of their existence, and guess what? They haven't grown tired. They haven't. You know what's interesting to me? Uh, it doesn't say that their song has changed. And they're still singing with the same tenacity and intensity. How many times have we heard people mention, well, we left because they were singing the same songs? Or they just keep repeating the same line over and over again. Can I tell you the problem with that thinking? It's narcissistic, me-centered, and not about the gospel at all. And listen, I, I had somebody approach me last time I said that. I'm not calling you a narcissist. Jesus didn't call Peter Satan. He said, you're thinking like Satan. It was the spirit behind me. What I'm thinking, what I'm saying is that you're thinking all about you. And it's not, you, 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 it blows my mind because the American church has become extremely me-centered, consumeristic. Why do we go to church? Because I need a word. No, you're supposed to take the word out into the world. In fact, we, it bothers me because we leave churches for these two reasons. I'm not being fed or they're not playing my favorite songs, Right? <laughs> Do y'all hear God in that at all? How many of you know the gospel is death to self? Listen, let me explain something. Adam and Eve are in the garden, right? The Bible says that they were made in his image and his likeness, right? Devil comes in. He's like, hey, girl. Hey, dude. Um, I got this fruit from this tree. And they're like, no, we can't, we can't eat from that. And they're like, he goes, did God really say? Because I feel like God's holding out on you. If you would eat this, you'd actually be like him. How I many of you know that they were already like him? They were made in his image and his likeness. So what happened is Eve ate the fruit for self-gain. And because they ate the fruit for self-gain, they became self-aware. They noticed that they were naked. The original sin was self. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you'll deny yourself. 
take up your cross and follow me daily. Paul said it this way. He said, there's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives inside of me. See, this is what gets me, you know, and, and being a speaker, a lot of times when they say I'm not being fed, it's on our pastors, right? That, that's what they're saying is the pastor's not saying what I want to hear, right? Can you show me in the Bible where it says your pastor's your chef? He's not. In fact, the word pastor is interchangeable with the word shepherd. Shepherds guard, they protect, and they guide. It's his job to show you where the pasture is so that you can eat. If you're the sheep and he's leading you, it's up to you to stick your nose in the grass and eat. Right? How many of you know if you have a Bible in your house, that's your food source? I'm just saying. And Jesus said it this way. He said, if you would eat of me, you'd never go hungry. So if you're hungry, my question is, are you, are you getting time with the Lord? Right? Like, are you, are you really diving in? See, man, I'm going to step on your toes a little bit because I love you. <laughs> I read this book by Tony Evans. Tony Evans, my dude. I love Tony Evans. And it's a book called Kingdom Man. I encourage every guy to go buy it right now. Not right now. We're in a message, but later. Okay. So in the book Kingdom Man, he says this. He says, if your wife mentions your pastor's name more than she mentions your name, then you're not pastoring your family right. Oh, snap. <laughs> But he's our senior pastor. Yeah, he's the pastor of the church. You're the pastor of your house. You're the one that's supposed to usher in the presence of God in your household. My question is, what if we were more intentional about ushering God's presence in our house than we were about chasing that promotion? I think generations would change. You know, living in Amarillo, there's been all these gun threats. You know what I think? I don't think kids are evil. I think they're crying out for attention. But there's two generations crying out for different things. One generation's crying out for validation while the other one's crying out for increase. And the one that's missing out is the one that's underneath. Listen, God is the one that brings the increase. Go read 2 Corinthians 9. It says the one who supplies the seed will increase and multiply. That's what it says. If you really trust God, then just give your all. Do everything as if you're doing unto the Lord, and he'll bring the provision and the increase. But don't neglect your children. Love your kids. You know, the Bible says raise up a child in the way of the Lord, and they won't depart from it when they're older. You know what I think's happened? is I think we've forgotten the ways of the Lord because we don't know the Bible and we just settle for what's good. So now we have a generation that's out there feeling entitled and don't, they're running every which direction. They're running to this place where they define truth instead of running to the truth because the truth was never brought in the household. Men, you're your senior pastor of your house. You're your senior pastor. I can't, I can't expect Bradley to read the Bible if he never sees me. I can't expect Bradley to pray if he never sees me. And I can't expect Bradley to treat his future wife in a godly way if he never sees me treat mine in a godly way. In fact, I'm going to get off this here. One more thing. Sorry, man. I know I still love you. You know what I mean? Y'all may grow more facial hair, but I'm going to catch up. But um, <laughs> Who ate the fruit first in the garden? Eve. Who did God go to? Adam. If something goes wrong in your house, who's God going to? The man. The man. We need to take responsibility for our family. We need to take responsibility. And that's how the church does what the church does, is we have healthy, God-centered families that come into healthy, God-centered communities, or a community or church which goes and influences and creates God-centered cities and states and nations. It starts in the house. It will change the house, will change the world. Believe it wholeheartedly. So anyways, go back to the angels. So this is how I imagine this. And, and I, you may not have a creative mind. like in, uh, Maybe mine's not creative. Maybe I'm just crazy. But I see this. like so. It says that they've got two wings and they cover their face. And the, and they, the presence of the Lord is there. So I feel like it's like radiating. Like they feel it and they're like, oh, holy, holy, holy. And the other guy's like, oh, my gosh, I feel it too. Holy, holy, holy. And there's this echoing around because there's this passion and there's this awe in this place of worship. My, my question, church, is how crazy would it be if one day during the middle of worship because God's presence was here we had one side of the room shouting to the other side of the room God is good he's here he's never left us he's changing lives how awesome would that be but it comes from this place where we don't lose our awe and we don't lose our wonder and you recognize the presence when the presence is there man I need another drink <laughs> God is good holler at your boy Isaiah 6, verse 5, it says, I said, woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of unclean lips, of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. 
Now, this is interesting because Isaiah, growing up in his culture, he would have known how holy God was. He would have also known how awesome he is. But this experience changes everything. In fact, it says that he, he, he experiences God and he says, Wo, uh, Woe is me, for I am ruined. Uh, your translation may say destroyed. It may say undone. And what's here is this Hebrew word, Demon. That's what it means. And the reason that he would have thought that is because he saw the Lord. And he remembers this conversation with Moses where Moses says, God, I want to see your glory. And God says, nobody can look upon my face and live. So he would have thought, man, I'm done for. I've seen the Lord. But this is interesting. Damal has another meaning too. It means to cease an activity in which one is engaged or to be silent. So this is what I think happened. Is I do think part of him thought I was going to be destroyed. But I think part of him wanted to engage in worship because he saw the worship taking place. And he said, but I need to be silent. Because he recognized that, like, there's something i got to get fixed in me first. And the scripture is awesome because it, it really shows us great insight. Did you notice the order that he recognizes things? He says, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I come from a people of unclean lips. It was me first than everybody else. See, before you could change the world, you have to change your world. It starts with you. Because this is what happens if it doesn't start with you, is you'll start holding people accountable to things that you're not willing to stand by. Sounds like legalism. Right? Super religious. The Pharisees were great at it. If you want to change the world, it starts with you. What that means is you've got to get the word inside of you. Let the word mold you from the inside out. And then what ends up happening, and I love what, how Chris Valadin says this, he says, typically the invisible kingdoms inside of us manifest around us. Which means that if you'll get the word of God inside of you, you'll see the word of God manifest itself outside of you. How many of you know the Bible is the living word of God? Yes. It's not just a book. It's alive. How does it live? When you buy into it and you start walking it out. But it starts with you. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. We're going to start working toward close. Verse 6 says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me. So he sees... He has this experience. He recognizes these things. He says, one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth. And he said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Now, this is amazing to me because what I see is I see the gospel. Matt, how do you, how do you, how do you see the gospel? Well, remember back in that time, this is pre-Jesus, pre-the cross. So if you sinned, what you needed to do was you needed to create an altar and make a sacrifice for your sin to be covered. Right? But Isaiah, in this story, was forgiven by grace because there was a sacrifice already present. How many of you know you're forgiven by grace because of sacrifice that's already present? Because Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the earth. Or if you just want to use the timeline, he was crucified 2,000 years ago and we're in the year 2018. You've been forgiven by grace. And then it, it hits me because, you know, I go back to this question. It says, but he saw God. Right? He saw God. And the Bible says that the seraphim had two wings to cover their face. And I was like, but what was covering Isaiah's? How is it? You know, because I go back to that question where Moses like, hey, I want to see your glory, but nobody can see my face and live. This is huge. John chapter 12, verse 41 says, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about it. How could Isaiah see God? He saw Jesus. He saw the risen son. Listen, this is, this is huge because the, the New Covenant and the New Testament, the Bible says we get to come boldly before the throne of grace. Isaiah is boldly before the throne of God. The, by, in the New Testament, we're forgiven by grace because Jesus went to the cross because a, a sin was already present or a sacrifice was already present to cover our sins. Isaiah has been forgiven by grace because of a sacrifice. This is what I think. So I think Isaiah is experiencing the New Covenant he would soon prophesy about. He's living it out. There's this excitement, but look at what this excitement does. Verse 8, it says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And he says this. He says, Here I am. Send me. Here I am. Send me. So he has this experience. He sees God and he's in the temple and he sees all this worship taking place. And, and God has this conversation. He says, Who's going to go out into the world? Who's going to speak on our behalf? Who's going to represent us? And Isaiah says, Send me. Send me. You know what's interesting? God's not talking to him. He was not a part of that conversation. He says, who's going to go into the world for us? 
This us that they're using is the same us in creation. Let us make men in our likeness, in our image. God is talking amongst himself. And Isaiah is like, I hear, I've seen it all. I've seen your goodness. I've experienced your grace. I've come boldly before your throne. And I hear you need somebody. I'm your God. I'm your God. My question is, do we have people in the church that have experienced God's goodness and experienced his grace and is willing to stand up and say, send me. There's a prayer that we always reference, and it's the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Can I tell you something, church? It's not going to happen because we facilitate a seat on Sunday. If you think this is how the kingdom comes, this is a, this is a piece of it. It's not all of it. Corporate worship is huge, man. We gotta come together and we we gotta seek the Lord. Hebrews says, Don't forsake the gathering of brothers as some are in the habit of doing, but continue to encourage each other. Like I need you. We need this. But if this is it, if your faith is go to church so I can punch a card and then I'm gonna go do what I usually do Monday through Saturday, the kingdom won't come. It won't. Because we haven't bought into what it's saying. The kingdom's gonna come when we rise up. When we say, I want to receive what you've given me on Sunday, I'm going to go take it out into the world. I'm going to receive your goodness, and I'm going to go tell people about it. I'm going to receive your grace, and I'm going to go show somebody what grace looks like. It comes when we take what we've received in our seat, and when we get on our feet, we take it into the world. That's how the kingdom comes. But God is still asking this question. He's saying, who's going to go out into the world? Who's going to go speak on my behalf? Who's going to go represent me to the people? And he's looking for a generation and a people and a church that is willing to jump up out of their seat because they've experienced his goodness and say, I'm the God. He's looking for families. He's looking for fathers. He's looking for kids that will rise up and say, I don't care how young I am. I'm willing to go. Send me out into the world. See, this is interesting. Isaiah's going to prophesy to a, a nation. He's one person. It doesn't matter how many people are with you. If you're willing to follow the Lord's voice, you'll change everything. It's it. If the Lord sends you, go. In fact, the Lord didn't even send him. He said, I want to go. God, wherever you send me. I'm, not, I'm your God. I want to close with this. Jesus said this. Go, therefore. Go. Not sit. Go. Go. Therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Church, this is what he's called us to do. That when we leave this place, right in here in a little bit, after we finish up in worship and we leave this place, that we would go into the world and we would create disciples. See, I think we've settled. Because how many of you know converts and disciples aren't the same thing? What we've done is we've created a fatherless generation in the church. We're like, okay, you said yes to Jesus. i got to go find the next one. A disciple is a learner. What it means is we do life with people. We tell them about the good news of Jesus and we grow them and we love on them and we encourage them. But there will be no disciples being made if we don't go first. It, look at that. Go and make disciples. It's when we go out of there and wherever you work, wherever you, wherever you live, in your house, start it in your house. It's got to start with me before it goes everywhere else. Whenever you go and you take the gospel, listen, that's how we change cities, towns, nations, states. If when we do what he says, we go and make disciples of all nations. So my question is, what was the moment that changed everything for you? Was it the moment you said yes to Jesus? Do you remember that moment or have we gotten over it? Was it the time that he brought you provision when you needed it the most? Was it the time that he brought you peace in your toughest storm? You know, the church has gotten in a really bad habit of forgetting. You know the secret to living a lifestyle of victory is remembering? It's remembering. What do you remember that God has done for you? And because of that moment, will we go? Are we bold enough to say, God, send me? Send me to the people that don't like me. The people that are going to throw stones at me. Send me to the, to the places that they're struggling and they're poor and they're broken. God, send me to the, the, the people that would, are maybe rich and wealthy that would look down upon me. Send me because if you are with me and you 
or for me, what can man do to me? So dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for today. God, we thank you for your goodness. God, we thank you for your word, God. And I pray that you would stir something up in our spirit that would, that would, that would not be complacent with sitting in our seats on Sundays and living life out just like it's day by day. Every day has intentionality. Every day has purpose, God. And you put destiny inside of everybody's hearts, God, and, and bring to life that destiny is service. That if we want to be great, we would take the place of the servant. If we want to be first, we take the place of the slave. God, let us be a people that aren't too big to wash people's feet. Amen. Let us be a people that notices the, the people that are outcasts, God. God, let us not be prideful. Let us do like you said. We deny ourselves and take up our cross daily. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray and everybody said. So, man, that word so impacts me. I, I love the opportunity to get to listen to Pastor Matt. And uh, I love the opportunity to get to, to, to have him come lead with us. And, and so this is what I heard the Lord saying to me. I would just share it with you. So when, when Isaiah is crying out, Lord, send me. I want to I wanna flip that for a second. And I wonder what, what you would think if you were the Lord and you heard you saying, send me. Would you even believe, would you believe it? Would you believe that there's anything behind it? I mean, man, we got to get to the spot that this thing changes in us. We, we have to encounter this time where this thing that God has done in us, and it changes, it changes everything about life. My question is, my question after that message is, if you were God, would you hire you? Not, not, not to be condemned, not to go, man, I, I probably wouldn't, and so why? But to stop living like that. Stop staying in that place. Man, there's, there's only two kinds of people that will stand in front of somebody and look for a job. A kind of person that really wants it and a kind of person that just knows they need it. And I, I think that's the same thing before God. Are you the kind of person that stands before God just because you know you need it? Or are you the kind of person that stands before Him because you want to represent Him? It's, that's the moment that will change everything for you. When you recognize His hand on your life and you recognize that I am not just going to come before you and say, God, send me, but I want, I want you to send me. I want to be used by you. I want to so encounter you that, that I look and I go, man, it's not about being perfect. It's not about, it's not about all of that stuff, but it is about recognizing the perfection that he's brought into us and living from that and going, yeah, I, I think that there needs to be enough boldness, enough boldness in every one of us to say, yeah, I think if, I think if I were to try to put myself in God's shoes, I think I would employ me. I want to be that guy. I want to be the guy that I believe when I stand in front of him, that I say, hey, God, send me. I want to, be, I want to be the guy that I think God would go, I think you mean that. I think you mean that. Let's be that. Let's be that. Let's see what happens in life. And I, I would ask you that you would, you would evaluate your, your life right now. Before I have you stand up and before we go take communion, before you make your way to this communion, and, and you take this, I want, I would ask you, when you go take this, does he know you mean it? Do you know you mean it? You're taking him in. You are experiencing him. And so, as we close this service out, I mean, man, I just, I struggle with this. Because I know if you're close enough to me and you know me very personally, you know that I love you. I do. And I struggle with, with um, taking you to the hard places. 
But here's just a little bit of truth that I'm going to close out our service with. I know that most of you will make your way to this table and you'll consider, you'll really consider, do I mean this when I come to this table? Because the word, like we talk about every week, the word says when we take communion, we are professing that we believe that he died for everything until he comes back. And we're supposed to do it until he comes back. But I wonder, you see, coming to this doesn't cost you very much. But the other thing we do when we close out our services, we come to this. And I'm just, I'm just saying, as soon as you figure out that what you bring to him, he doesn't want to do that to you, but he wants to do that for you. I'm just saying, if you won't go all in, then understand, understand why you don't experience being all in. I, I know that's harsh. And I know some of you are probably like, I don't even know what he's talking about. But I'm talking about the word also says that when we bring our tithes and our offerings, that here men collect it, but in heaven Jesus receives it. And the reason that he allows that to happen in our life is because he knows that that part costs us. So how can we be willing, honestly, I, I, I know I'm being your preacher here, but how can we be willing to say I'm all in, but we really don't want to be all in when it costs us? I'm just saying, if you're going to evaluate God send me, do you mean it? Because I think that he... He leaves that in because I would just challenge you. I know some people go, hey, man, I don't think that's the thing. I would just say read Jesus's words in Matthew when he talks about the very issue. And he says, hey, you bring your tithes when it comes to the to the money part. But do you bring your tithes when it comes to everything else? Because he doesn't just want the tithe of your money. He wants the tithe of your heart. He wants the tithe of your life. He wants the tithe of your efforts. He requires that of you. Will you be willing to say, send me? think it's a big deal so father i pray over this body and i know the i know the struggles are so real god but i know i mean we either believe that you are the author of life that you have your hand on us or we don't and each week you have a new level you want us to go to a new place to a new depth to a new place of trust and so father i i say to you i want to be the guy that when I say send me, I want to be the guy that I, I really believe will go. I don't want to just know you because I need you. I want to know you because I want you. And I want to lead a church that's the same way. So, Father, I pray that you let these words that Pastor Matt had brought today resonate in our hearts. And now as we close out our service with communion and the time to bring our tithes and offerings, I just say as a body, Lord, let us be the body that says send me send me. We love you and we bless you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. So would you stand with me? And I'm just going to invite you to make your way to the communion table this morning. And I just say, as you go there, ask him, am I willing, do I really want you to send me? You make your way to the communion table and we have our tithes and offering boxes around. You make your way to those and use those. And if there's anything we can be here, we'll be here to pray with you before you leave.
Center. So it's the perfect time for you to learn where the Welcome Center is at. <laughs> but also, in the back rooms, Mark's old office will be a resource center where we'll have stuff for small groups and books and stuff like that. And then Mike's old office will be our cry room, or uh, just the cry room, right? Just if you need to cry. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> or the prayer room. So, but church, I just want to tell you guys, we love you guys. Man, and go be the river. The Bible says that when Jesus gets life in you, or when you get Jesus in you, rivers of living water will flow from you. Go bring life everywhere you go. We love you, church. Y'all have a great week.